simple enough day. Uh, one last thing that I wanted to reference is that uh, there's a little block in here for asking for anybody that might be musically inclined. If you have gifts uh, of, of music, of musical instrumentation or singing, and you would like to share those gifts with the congregation for the glory of our God, uh, you can see Pam's number there. Reach out to Pam and uh, make that happen. Maybe not today while, the, while Fred and Pam are on vacation. So uh, give it a couple of days and, and, then, uh, and then bug her with that information. All right, I think that's all the announcements that we want to draw attention to. This morning as, you, as we prepare for worship, Psalm 1828 is our, is our meditation text. Let's consider these words during the prelude. For it is you who light my lamp, the Lord my God lightens my darkness. Good morning. I invite you to stand as you are able this morning for our call to worship. And for our call to worship this morning, we will be reading uh, responsively, so it should be reflected on the screen behind, but also I'll be reading the lead text, and you can read the indented text, if you will, in response. So let's hear this call together. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Lord is God. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. Let's please pray with me. The Lord is God, a triune being beyond our comprehension, a, a creator of universes of stars and galaxies and worlds and earths and creatures and beings and you desire to being to bear your image, and we get to come worship that God today. The Lord is God, and the Lord provided for us a way to meet his holiness, covered us in righteousness with the death of his son, Jesus, who we are going to sing praises for today. Our Savior, our Christ, Jesus, 
came and kept the promise that the triune God created. He desired us. He created us and desires a relationship with us, and so we get to come together today to worship you, our God. The Lord is God, and God is good. We'll sing praises to your name, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together from page two of the bulletins as we sing, Lift High the Name of Jesus. Lift high the name of Jesus, of Jesus, our King. Make known the power of his grace, the beauty of his peace. Remember how his mercy reached and we cried out to him. He lifted us to sight to freedom from our sin. Oh, sing my soul and tell all he's done till the earth and heavens are filled with his glory. Lift high the name of Jesus, of Jesus our Lord. His power in us is great is greater than this world to share the reason for our hope to serve with love and grace that all who see him shine through us might bring the father praise oh sing my soul and tell all he's done till the earth and heavens are free with his glory. Lift high the name of Jesus, of Jesus, our light. No other name on earth can save, can raise us to life. He opens up our eyes to see the harvest he has grown. We labor in his as he leads in her soul. Oh, sing my soul and tell all he's done till the earth and heavens are filled with his glory. Let's continue singing on the next page. Wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy, O oh my soul, like the sea billows roar. Since Jesus came into my heart, I have ceased from my wandering and going astray. Since Jesus came into my heart, and my sins, which were many, are all washed away. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy, oh my soul, like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I shall go there to dwell in that city I know. Since Jesus came into my heart, and I'm happy, so happy as onward I go. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy, oh my soul, like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. 
please be seated. We get to open the word together now. Uh, scripture reading is printed on page four of your bulletins if you'd like to read from there. Our text this morning is well known, John 3, 16 uh, through 21. You can see the page number there. And as always, we'll be reading from the ESV if you'd like to follow along with your pew Bibles. John 3, 16 through 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the Holy Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. At this time we come to our confession of sin and our assurance of our pardon. Before we read together as a congregation... Let's take a silent moment of personal confession. Lord, as the text in John said, let us bring our many and innumerable sins into the light. Let us confess you as God, and I pray that you receive this corporate reading as an act of worship, a way to glorify you and your righteousness and your forgiveness of our sins. In the Lord's name we pray, amen. Let's read together from the text in our bulletins, taken from the song two. You I lift up my soul. Together we read, We confess to you, O God, that we have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and are not worthy to be called your children. At times we have tried to build a partnership between righteousness and lawlessness. At times we have tried to bring into fellowship light with darkness. Have compassion on us and forgive our sin, casting all of them into the depth of the sea. For the sake of him who loves us, Christ Jesus, your Son and our Savior. Amen. And from 1 John 1, hear this assurance of our pardon. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please stand again as you are able. From page five of our bulletins, let's sing together, The Light of the World is Jesus. The whole world was lost in the darkness of sin. The light of the world is Jesus. Like sunshine at noonday, his glory shone in. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, it's shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. have we who in Jesus abide. The light of the world is Jesus. We walk in the light when we follow our guide. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, 
night is shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. sunlight in heaven we're told the light of that world is Jesus the lamb is the light in the city of gold the light of the world is Jesus come to the light is shining for thee sweetly the light as I was blind, but now I can see the light of the world is Jesus. Please be seated. As we go to prayer, I want to encourage you to remember our God can hear us. So come with your hearts ready to be heard. Let's pray. Father, we come into your presence. We come into that light that we just sang about, trusting that you are not just willing to hear us, but able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. And so we keep praying that by faith, trusting you that you are good and you are capable and you are willing. As it aligns with your will, Father, we ask that you would free us to watch and wait in in expectancy. And where it's not in alignment with your will, we ask that you help us to let go of our grip on what we think is best for our lives. But here we are with all of our broken places and all of our hurts and all of our fears all the anxieties that would keep us up at night, all the things that would threaten us, you remind us are nothing in light of you. That greater is he who is in us than he who is in this world. And I ask, Father, that that truth would bear us up as we bring to you these very specific needs, the ongoing challenges of health that we Uh, many of us in our congregation experience the dogged constant drag of living in fallen bodies as we think about the people that in our midst that are especially going through challenges we're also thinking of the ways that you keep sustaining them we think of doris and who's here this morning and we were grateful that she came through the the most recent bout of 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 frustrating, frustrating, sometimes debilitating discomfort and and weakness. Um, Lord, I pray that she would rest in you. Thank you for her persistent commitment to you, even when life is hard. Thank you for bringing her through this, and we ask that you would continue to give her grace and healing and provision. We ask that same thing for Carol and Gail Kauser, especially for Carol right now. She perhaps even this moment is in surgery and I pray that you would give her a sense of your presence in in that place that you would uphold her you would sustain her you would protect her that you would heal her Lord we pray that as we prayed last night in the in the prayer call that went out that that you would give them wisdom that that Gail would be able to rest in knowing his wife is in your faithful hands but that he would also rest from any anxiety that might be welling up inside of him as he realizes that his that the the person who has stood by him and is there usually with him and is able to help him with his ailments isn't able to be there and i pray that he would be ready to enter into whatever next stage of life that might require of both of them again we pray for wisdom that you would provide for them exactly what they need that they would be ready to hear it we're thankful for Joanne Ray and 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 that you've sustained her with and you've surrounded her with friends but father we we pray that she would come through this latest 
round of, of, of chemotherapy with, with a heart that wants to know you and lean into you. I pray that the gospel would abound in the midst of this suffering moment for her. Bring healing to her body, but more importantly, to her soul. Father, there's so many more on this list that we could pray for. You know them all. Would you sustain and provide? Would you give us eyes to see you at work? We're also thankful that you call us into community. You invite us to be a part of each other's lives. And so for all the different things that we referenced at the beginning of the worship service, opportunities to serve and to, and to love and to be loved, Lord, I pray that we would take those opportunities seriously, but more importantly, that you would be in the midst of all of them and that you'd be glorified as we do life together. And as we think beyond just our church and we think about our partnership with other churches, we think about our sister church down in Springfield, we pray for Steve and Lawrence, we pray for the people at Exodus Church, we pray that the gospel would continue to go forth. Lord, it's exciting for me to hear all of the ways that they are actively pursuing lost people in that community, and that church is growing as people come to know you. We thank you for the incredible giftings that you've put there to make that happen, and we ask that you'd continue to sustain them. And we're also mindful that even this afternoon, as as Covenant Fellowship Church our, and our friend K.J. Kim, who's preached here before, they're going to be voting to decide whether or not they want to come into our presbytery, to be a part of the Presbyterian Church in America, to, to link arms with other brothers and sisters and, and, uh, and know that they are, can be cared for and watched over and provided for as, as they do life in their church. Lord, help us to learn what it means to be a connectional church. Help them celebrate that and take it seriously for their own sake uh, this afternoon when they meet. Lord, we ask that in all of these things and every prayer request that we're, we've said out loud and every prayer request that's, in, that's simmering around in our hearts that you would help us to trust you and that you would be glorified in doing what you do best, which is to be a God so that we can be free from trying to be you. And we praise you in it and for it in Jesus' name. Oh, and Father, thank you for the offering that we're about to take. Would you give us hearts that are generous and overflowing with joyful gratitude in all that you have given us? And we pray then for a blessing specifically on this offering that you would use it mightily for your kingdom's sake. In Jesus' name, amen.
Please stand as we sing the doxology. <laughs> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. If our kids would like to come on up, we can pray together. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Father, for every child sitting here, every young person sitting in the, in the pews, every one of them who's brought here to this day, this moment, in this place, by you, so that they could hear from you. And I pray that their ears would be open and they would be ready to listen and maybe learn something about you today, learn about who you are and and what your love me can mean for them and how they ought to live in response to it. I pray that they would entrust themselves not to their own trying to be a good boy or girl, but to you, our good and faithful God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. All right, while they're getting situated, I want to encourage you to turn in your Bibles to 1 John. So we continue in our series in 1 John, grateful for, to be able to uh, get that introductory message out of the way, and, it, and a passage that, uh, that really reveals most of the themes of this incredible letter by John, the, the man who called himself the one whom Jesus loved. He understood that he was loved by the Savior. And that overflows into everything that he does. There's a lot more about John that may be worth knowing that, that maybe we could touch on before we read our passage. But um, some have called John the, the theologian of the New Testament. I mean, all of you could call Paul a theologian. You could call John, call John a theologian, of course. But, but it's interesting, uh, as Dick Lucas, a theologian and pastor, said, well, it seems that every other writer of the New Testament is concerned primarily with what God says and what God does. John seems concerned primarily with telling us who God is. If you read John's gospel, he tells us and really seems to emphasize throughout that book that God is spirit. Here in the first epistle of John, John 1 John, he speaks of, Jesus, or of, of God as two things. God is light and God is love. This morning we're going to emphasize that God is light. In other words, he doesn't just, John doesn't just want us to know information about God's actions, but he wants us to know God. And that's what we've been, that's what we experience in that first message is just a reminder that this is the God who can be known and wants us to know him. And when we get to know him, the God who can be known, we realize that he's the God who knows us and wants relationship with us. So this morning, as we consider this truth, as we think about this sermon series offering aspects of who God is, we're going to be looking at one very specific aspect that will pop up throughout the letter, that God is light. So look with me, 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, and we're just going to read through verse 10, the end of the chapter. This is the message we've heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. And if we say we have no sin, 
We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Let's pray. Father, would you help us take these handful of verses and apply them to our hearts? Would your Holy Spirit open our eyes to what is true here and open our ears so that we can hear from you? We pray in Christ's name. Amen. One of the things about, uh, uh, about me that you may know, because I think I've confessed it on multiple occasions, is that I'm a bit of a cheapskate. Um, when, we, when, you, when you own a house, there's a couple of things that are kind of important. One of them is that you always have to have enough light bulbs, right? But for me, I figure there are s- certain areas of the house that you can, you can live without light it, because you don't go there very often, right? So one of those areas is in our, in our house that we're selling, and, and by God's grace, we're, we're thankful. We have an offer on the house, so we're praising God for that. We're waiting for that to all get finished. But we have this one particular area, and after all of our kids graduated and moved out, we didn't have youth group in our home anymore, uh, having a pool table that also doubled as a ping pong table became less important, and more important became another place to stack junk, okay? And that's what ended up happening. Well, because that's happening, you can... Uh, you can live without the light bulbs that are directly over that space, especially if a light bulb burns out somewhere in the house and you're like, well, I ran out of my extra light bulbs and I really don't want to go spend more money, so I'll just go downstairs and I'll unscrew one of the light bulbs, I'll take it up and I'll put it in the lamp that's upstairs that went out. And then I did that with the second light in that area. And then eventually there was another area of the house that, that uh, also didn't probably need too much light, so I stole another one from that area. But when it comes time to actually sell the house, you need light bulbs everywhere. And so I started, I bought a whole bunch of light bulbs, finally got over my cheapskatedness, if that's a phrase, and started putting light bulbs in everywhere. And when you start putting the lights back in, into the places where it's been a bit dark, you start to notice (laughs) more, don't you? You start to see the piles of dust, the books that you thought you'd lost that were piled on the on the pool table or wherever you put it you things get exposed that you didn't really realize were there that's what light does we have a god who john tells us is light that he is light and theologically that has all kinds of Ramification has all kinds of realities connected to it, but two primary things come out when anytime the Bible talks about light and God being light. It, light is always referring to one of two things, either some sort of intelligence or understanding or moral or purity or goodness. And so when John says that God is light, He wants us to probably catch both of those nuances, that the knowable God is all-knowing, and he is utterly and completely pure. He is supreme intelligence, and he is supreme purity and holiness. And in this passage, as he declares, God is light and that in him is no darkness at all, he calls us to walk in that light. To walk out of the shadows, out of the the dusty, dark, morally questionable places that we find ourselves sometimes going, and walk into his light. This passage is going to tell us three ways that we walk in that light as we consider that particular idea. But before I do that, I want to read this little quote from Eric Raymond. He says, what makes this all the more astounding is that God himself is infinite. In other words, the infinite God has plumbed the depths of his infinite character, surveyed it, and concluded with credibility of his divine character, I am perfectly light. 
In the mansions of God's character, there is not a single room, closet, or hallway of iniquity. Every room is bright and light and, and a fragrance, a bouquet of holiness, he says. So we walk into that sort of bouquet of holiness. We walk into the light in these three ways this morning. The first is we walk in the light by living obediently. Those first couple of verses there after um, verse 5, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The idea of this passage, the idea of walking obediently is a, is a twofold concept. It's that we live holy, H-O-L-Y. We live set apart. That's what holy really means. The God who is utterly holy is different than all of creation. And he says, walk into that set apart kind of life. We live this life pursuing this moral purity as we walk into the presence of a sin-hating God. In him there is no darkness, John says. So if we stand it in, in light of him, in his presence, it's going to expose those things that are not so pleasant. It's going to reveal those things that are maybe a little more dark, those crevices and cracks in our heart where we're holding on to sin and we're holding on to those things that would, call, that would cause us to stumble and fall, things that would be contrary to him. We heard those words earlier in the scripture text from John chapter 3. This is the verdict, light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds would be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Ultimately, God sees it all. And when we... And, and we might feel that temptation in our hearts, like when we know that there are certain things that we're holding on to, certain idols that we're not ready to let go, certain comforts that, that are eating away at us, but we're not ready to release them. Those moments when we come to church and we're hearing truth or when we read our scriptures, it would almost want, make us want to maybe not come to church this Sunday or maybe not read the Bible today because I don't really want to deal with that. I don't want to let that be exposed. We feel that, right? Now, we're going to come back and see how this gets applied to the gospel, but at the very least, we should start to feel the discomfort of it. We feel uncomfortable in sin, don't we? we but we're called to live holy, to live these set-apart lives. And, but we're also called, living obediently means to live holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, to live as a whole person. You, as a child of the king, are called to live according to who you are. That the call to live in the light and not in the darkness, John says, is, is, is a call for all of those who have been called out of the darkness. This is, it's, it's the call for those who, are, who, who understand and have had their, their lives transformed by him. We have fellowship with one another, he says in verse 7. We have the blood of Jesus cleansing us from all of our sin. It's, it's the reality of who we are. Jesus who died for my sin is the Jesus who would call me to run from my sin. Do I live this integrated life or do I live a disintegrated life where my sin defines me more than my Savior does? And so the call is to increasingly through the course of our lives to align the truth of who I am with the truth of what I do. If you're taking notes at home, you're feeling the discomfort of that. You realize I don't always live that way. In fact, John would say here at the end of the passage, if we say we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. We in our honest moments, we'll go, whoo, I'm struggling with this obedience part. The overflow of a heart that's been captured by God, though, is a heart that begins to see that and wants to see that rectified by God's grace. And so the process of sanctification is faith that he has declared what is true of me and then by his grace to walk in it.
to live obediently. To acknowledge that as we look at this, this is an awkward way that John writes. It almost feels like it's that the, the if and the then are, are, are uh, there's not really a thens in this passage, but the, but the conditional kind of language that's used here, if we say we have fellowship him while we walk in darkness, we lie. If we walk in the light as he in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin. You might read that and say, so what you're telling me is that if I live obediently, Jesus has to cleanse me from my sin. If I do what is right, Jesus has to cleanse me. If you stumble into that version of reading this kind of if-then statement, then you're falling into legalism. You're falling away from the gospel. Forgiveness, the question is this, is forgiveness tied to our, to our obedience? Yes. But is forgiveness caused by our obedience? Does God have to forgive you because you obey? The answer is no. That is not what this means. Our obedience, though, is caused by and confirmation of our forgiveness. It's not the cause of our forgiveness. Sometimes in English we use if-then statements as a kind of straightforward conditional thing, a predictive thing. If you do this, then you'll get that. But that's not what's going on with John, and I want to make sure that we underline that. We make sure that we understand that this is not predictive. If you do this, then Jesus has to forgive you. This is reflective. Jesus has forgiven you. If he's forgiven you, then you'll do this. That's what John means. In our family, we peddle in obnoxious dad jokes. If I say I'm hungry, Pete will always say, Hi, hungry. I'm Pete. <laughs> right. Pete, that just tells me you are a Keithley. Because Pete tells bad dad jokes, it proves that he's a Keithley. So if I were to say it's maybe more like this, if Pete says, hi, hungry, I'm Pete, then he is a Keithley. What I don't mean is if he stops saying, hi, hungry, I'm Pete, then he must not be a Keithley. It's reflective, meaning he is wholly a Keithley, fully, completely a Keithley, whether he likes it or not. If you say obnoxious dad jokes, that reflects a reality. You're a Keithley. If you see your heart gravitating toward holiness, it exposes it, the truth that you are God's. But let's be honest, there's another part here. We don't, as I said, we feel the discomfort of that. We're not always living these obedient lives. And so there's a second part that John would reveal to us as we walk in the light, as we live in the light. We live obediently for sure. We pursue that, but we also have to live, secondly, vulnerably. To live vulnerably. To, to live in a way that says, I've got to be honest about my sin. As I read a moment ago, if we say we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. We stand before a holy God and we let him search the dark places of our hearts and it will and ought to expose us. And so while our temptation is to run from him and not to want to engage with him because we're concerned that the, of the shame that's going to fill up in our hearts, God is standing ready to hear us be vulnerable back at him he knows it already confess it to him we confess every sunday and maybe you feel like you can stay kind of disconnected from that i'll say all the words but my heart isn't really engaged in it but god would call us to be vulnerable psalm 139 oh lord you have searched me and known me you know when i sit down when i rise up you discern my thoughts from afar you search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. He knows your heart. He's not surprised if you're vulnerable with him. He's not surprised if you tell him the truth. God, I see it. I acknowledge it. In fact, that's the very nature of the language of confession, right? To confess means to agree with. We confess something, we could, we're agreeing that what we're doing is contrary to him. And so he wants us to be vulnerable with him, to be open with him. 
And let the Word of God do its job, like the author of Hebrews says. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts. And then he says these very uncomfortable words, no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. In other words, he knows when you are sleeping. He knows when you're awake. <laughs> he knows if you've been bad or good. No, but, but the rest of that is not so be good for goodness sake. It's so be honest for goodness sake. God invites us to vulnerability with him, but also with each other. We have fellowship with each other, right? Those verses there, 8, 9, and following, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. Confess your sin, he says, and he's faithful and just and will forgive your sins. We, we enter into a, a community of vulnerability. We're supposed to be honest with each other about our fears and about our weakness, about our stupid about our sin and our foolishness we're called to enter into relationships with each other where we actually start to tell each other the truth that doesn't mean you it's not vulnerable that you are constantly spouting what's wrong with everyone else in your life and you want people to know it's vulnerable when you're saying what's wrong in my own heart and i want the people around me to know in his book, how, uh, The Gospel, How the Church Portrays the Beauty of Christ, Ray Ortland shares this beautiful culture, gospel culture, as he calls it, and he'll, uh, the last line will reference that. He says, a heart aloof from God grows aloof from others. It engages in merciless comparisons and endless fault fighting, finding. Therefore, all restoration begins by going back to God first, prodigals that we are. The wonderful thing is that we, when we lose our way, God's not hard to find again. He's made himself very findable. He is in the light right there in the place of truth and honesty and openness and confession and owning up. God himself awaits us there. We are sinners can go to him freely through the cross of Christ. So we're vulnerable with God there in the light, but only in the light, everything gets better and only in the light, everything gets better in our relationships with one another too. The price we pay is to face ourselves. It's humiliating and painful. That's why we shun the light. Two episodes, uh, there, there are episodes in our past that we don't want to think about, harsh words, acts of betrayal, broken promises, and worse. So we shove those memories down, writes Ortland, into the darkness of our excuses and blame shifting. We refuse to call sin, sin. We feel too threatened by what we have done, even to admit it to ourselves, much less confess it to others. But those places of deepest shame are where the Lord Jesus loves us most tenderly. He said, is there any reason not to walk in his light together where we recover faith, fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin? It is refreshing to come back out into the light of honesty again where we first met the Lord. It is there that ex-friends can be re regained by love. It is there that Jesus is glorified in the eyes of the world. And then here's that reference that I hinted at at the beginning. Gospel doctrine creates gospel culture. Do we have that here? Do we have a place where we can be so honest with each other we're never shocked? Or when somebody tells you the truth, you go, oh my. Maybe I, I'm not so sure I'm ready to hear that from you. He invites us into a gospel culture. We went to, when I was at the camp last week and had my, or week, however long ago, that was last week, it feels like 14 months ago, um, last week, and we, one of the things that the, the, the speaker for the camp asked of all of the adults that were there, and I wasn't planning on being there for very much, but I did stick around for this one, one of the talks, and he had asked us all, all of the adult leaders, to just come and share the two truths and the lies in the lie game. Have you ever done that? Where you tell two truths and one lie and you try to see if anybody can figure out which one's which. And you got to get a little creative in how you share that so that you can keep them off the scent, but you got to be truthful. And so I came up and I said three things. I once convinced a woman to marry me without even ever, ever having dated her. I broke my leg playing soccer and I was detained by a foreign government for wielding a knife. Those are my three statements. Do you guys know me well enough to know which one's which? 
Well, the guy leading the thing knew me well enough. He didn't know those, the two things that, uh, that were true, but he knew full well which one was the lie. He's like, you never played soccer in your life. And everybody in the room, everybody in the room started laughing. And then so when they had the vote, guess what? The, the fact that somebody knew me well enough swayed the whole room. Even though I thought the other two were way more outlandish. She said yes. And it was a butter knife, and it was at the airport in Guatemala, but I still got pulled aside and uh, had a good talking to. <laughs> There's something about the truth when we, uh, when we are in the midst of people who know us, when we're in the midst of a God who knows us. And so God would maybe invite us to, as it were, shuck the temptation to dishonesty and move toward vulnerability. And so just one, some, this is a hyper quick uh, practical application that you can write down. Shuck that temptation away from vulnerability. Shuck it. Be specific. These are S-H-U-C-K. You ready? Be specific. It's not confession if you say, yeah, I sinned. It's confession if you say, I lost my temper on my wife. I struggled last week with my pride because my coworker got the promotion and I didn't, even though I did more work than he did or she did. Be specific. Be honest. That is aligning with truth. Honest agreement, confessing it. Be, allow it to make you uncomfortable. If you're not uncomfortable when you're expressing your, the ugly parts of your heart, you're probably not expressing the parts of your heart that you should be expressing because it should be uncomfortable. Let it be continuous. That is, you don't stop confessing it. You keep talking about it until God changes it. You keep confessing it. You keep it in the light until it's been transformed. And finally, be known. Take the unknown out of the darkness and bring it into the light. Be known. That's with a K. For those of you who are trying to write that down, Jennifer said, they're never going to get the known. I mean, I'm, they know how to spell. I know they know that, and she knew that. But, but uh, that doesn't sound like a K word. So I, but I'm sorry I couldn't come up with a K word, that, but this one works. Be known. Shuck that invulnerability and give yourself to vulnerability. Live vulnerably. But finally, one of the most challenging and confusing parts of this, the things that we often we gloss over and we misread is this last bit that we are called to live freely there's a common thread in american religion and i think it's infiltrated the church and i and i would dare say there's probably not a one of us in this room that at times hasn't assumed this but you probably read or have read first john 1 9 as uh, to to say something that it doesn't actually say so you've got to bear with me for a minute as we think about this. I'll be shocked if some of you have not at least thought that that's what this said all along. That maybe you thought when I said, if you confess your sin, you thought it meant God is merciful and will forgive your sin. Is that what you thought it said? I know you know the words don't say merciful, but you hear faithful and just and you immediately reconnect and, and reinterpret it to mean merciful. That God's mercy is what makes God forgive you. Okay? That doesn't sound terrible, does it? You're like, okay, what, what, what's wrong with that? Yeah, it doesn't say that, but that seems perfectly okay, right? Let me say this. God will forgive, and so he does show his mercy. There's no question that is a truth that is hidden in the background of this passage. God's merciful and his mercy runs deep in his veins and that is on display when forgiveness of sins comes. But God doesn't forgive you because he's merciful in a moment. God's mercy is the foundation that's going to lead to everything else I'm going to say, but it's not what the passage says. Because the fact is mercy is never can never be demanded. If somebody, if you hurt someone in your life and they call you on it and your response says, I'm sorry, 
and they're not ready to receive your I'm sorry. And they start to express how much it's hurt them. I mean, I'm speaking completely hypothetically. This has never happened in my marriage, ever. Um, and you say, and if I, were to, if I were to say, but Jen, I said I'm sorry. The, the, the implication, the, 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 word, the phrase in parentheses at that moment is, since I said I'm sorry, you have to forgive me. But mercy is an option among two options. I can forgive you, or I can choose not to. Now, because Jen has been overwhelmed by the incredible grace and mercy of God, for sure she is inclined to give me forgiveness. But is God required to forgive anybody? Remember, there's this moment when Moses is talking about a God, God and Moses are talking, and then John, or Paul, rather, the Apostle Paul in Romans 9 picks up on this. He quotes it, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. It means he's not obligated to have mercy on all people everywhere all the time. He doesn't have to do that. It is his disposition to want to do that for some, but he doesn't do that for all because some die in their sins and go to to hell, right? It's the uncomfortable truth. God's not infinitely merciful on all people at all times. He's not obligated to give mercy. So this isn't about God has to forgive you if you say you're sorry because he's merciful. This passage tells us something more beautifully confident, something that will lead you to a hope and an encouragement and a a willingness to actually bring to you, bring to him your need for mercy. You can ask him for forgiveness. You can ask him for mercy. And the foundation of that is two other things that these, these words here that you saw. He is faithful and he is just. Your confidence in the mercy of God isn't just because that's just what God does. God just forgives. Your confidence in the mercy of God is because God is two things, faithful and just. He's faithful, and that frees us from doubt. It's built on a promise. John says God's mercy, his forgiveness, is ours because he's enduringly committed to keeping his word. You can imagine John sitting there, he's writing this, and the words are replaying in his mind, words that he wrote down for posterity back in John's gospel, but that would have stuck in his heart because when he heard them, they would have caught him in, in the throat. He would have been just overwhelmed by it. When he heard Jesus say, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he's given me, but raise it up on the last day. It's faithfulness that leads us to the confidence that we can go to God and he won't say, not this time. That sin was too much. That sin was beyond the pale and I won't forgive you. No, Jesus promised I'll not lose a one of them. I will. It's faithfulness that, that guarantees you forgiveness as a Christian. Or maybe he, he, could, he could almost hear Jesus with his Nazareth accent saying, I will be with you to the end of the days after his resurrection. Or maybe all the apostles will be sitting around after Jesus rose, went up into glory. They're sitting around, they're, they're processing all of this, waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. I'm just speculating here. And they think, you know, the whole, all of the scriptures, he said all the scriptures speak about him. What about that one time when, when God is talking to Joshua, who's terrified, but jo- told, told Joshua that he was going to take the people into the promised land. He's going to take over for Moses. And God said those words to Joshua, his Hebrew name, Yeshua. Have I not commanded you, Joshua, Yeshua, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. There's promise. Wherever you go, I'm with you. And then they went, oh, I can just imagine. The disciples going, what? That's crazy. That first Yeshua And the second Yeshua comes along and he tells us, Jesus, he comes along and he says, I will be with you always. 
don't be afraid. That's the promise of God. We are caught there. We have a promise that, that, that provides forgiveness, not just whether or not God feels like being merciful today. Permission just to speak to one son really quickly, Pete. The days leading up to you coming to our home, today is Pete's gotcha day. This is the, well, 19 years ago today, Pete came to live with us. It took about two more years to get all the finalized adoption stuff, but we call that our gotcha day. We celebrated lunch yesterday with Pete to, to, to celebrate him and, and that incredible opportunity for us. Of course, we made him do some yard work while he was here, but... A promise began to form in our heart the first time we met you. A promise that we would be your parents, that we would commit to you, that we would pay for your food, that you eat a lot of, that we would... <laughs> no, it's okay. You didn't know us, though. He didn't know us. We were strangers, plucking him out of the, of the comfort of a home that he did know, a, 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 with a family that cared for him, but knew that they would never be his forever family. And so we brought him into our home. He had to just learn to trust our promise that God intended him to be with us, that he intended you to be with us and our family so that all the costs of adoption and all of the headaches and all the exhaustion over two years of just getting you home and then all of the challenges of raising a, a teenager, all of the challenges and heartaches and frustrations along the way, him, him having to deal with sinners and, and us having to deal with a sinner, all of that could have wrecked this. We made a promise, Jen and I did, to each other that we were going to love you, Pete, no matter what, that we were going to be there for you no matter what, no matter how hard things got. It was based on a promise. But see, there's this other part. It that led us to keep this thing and, and, and that, that benefited us through it all. It wasn't just that we wanted to be faithful by God's grace to Pete and his coming into our family. We wanted to be faithful to a promise, but it was also justice that we could lean on. The judge had to sign off, and when he signed off and we got those papers signed and he, and he said that now you get all of the rights and privileges of being a Keithley, in that moment, we were able to, we could from that moment on be able to come back and say, here are the adoption papers. It's legal. Here are some of the bills that we had to pay. We have proof financially that he is ours. The debts that we had to pay to make him part of our family. It would be unjust for anyone to take him from us. And that's what John says. It would be unjust for our sin to ever separate us from God again because Jesus already paid the debt. Jesus already determined the adoption. Jesus already paid the price even when we are still sinning, even when, when we're living in that vulnerable place that obe the obedience is, is lacking, where we're not fully holy and holy. He is faithful and just. He will intercede for us. Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how, how will he not also graciously give us all things? Who brings any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus died, John, or Paul says, and more than that was raised, who is at the right hand of God doing something really crazy right now, interceding for you, interceding for me. When we say, I confess, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Double jeopardy has no place in the gospel. You can't be punished for your sins because Jesus was already punished for them. And so it ought to change the way that we look at our sin, freeing us from condemnation, 
living freely, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So brothers and sisters, as we wrap up, our noble God has made himself known. He's the God of light. He invites us out of the shadows into his light to certainly live lives of obedience, holy and holy, to live vulnerably as fellow sinners, honest with him and honest with each other, and to live freely, free of doubt, free of condemnation, doubt that he'll say, I'm not going to forgive this time, doubt that he'll, or, or, or fear that he'll ever condemn us. That's what he promises to his children. This morning, I suspect there are some in this room that aren't sure if they're in the light. Not sure if these words in this passage are yours. I want to encourage you, come talk to me after the service. We'll slip away, we'll pray together, we'll talk to God together, we'll get vulnerable together. And by God's grace, you'll be able to walk away from this place with confidence to live freely from doubt and condemnation forevermore. But to the rest of us, I say, praise God. We have such a joy because our God is light. Let's pray. Father, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And this word lights the path right to Jesus. I pray that that he would be so bright in our eyes right now that we would want to see nothing of our sin and everything of his mercy and grace, his faithfulness and his justice. To him be the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able for our closing song this morning on page 7, Cleanse Me. up.
Receive then this benediction now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless before the pre his presence with glory and with great joy. To the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and forevermore. Amen. Amen.